So it's around the world in 80 days. Well, that's the old movie, I guess. Well, this isn't 80 days. <clears throat> it's 80 years, starting in 1929. So we're going to look at not just the covers and but actually why and what happened and all the, the circumstances around these events. And the first one is the Graf Zeppelin LZ-127. Then we're going to look at a private aircraft, this Atlas Sky Merchant. They visited 30 cities or so on a little bit of a trip, marketing trip, cruise ships, an icebreaker that went down to Antarctica. The spaceship, of course, it went around the world a few times. Spaceship Challenger, uh, some, a personal trip, some commemorative covers, and then some commercial airline covers. So the Graf Zeppelin, this was a, a rigid airship, not a hot air balloon. It was a rigid airship that was filled with flammable hydrogen. And it flew from Lakers to Lakers around the world, financed, of course, by William Randolph Hearst, who paid $100,000. But it was on the condition that it start, it has to be, the Statue of Liberty had to be the start and the finish. Flying time was 12 days. Postage was $3.52 for a letter, $1.76 for a postcard. It was the only airship to go around the world, or RTW. Now, the interesting thing is because the trip really began May 14th, 14th when it left Germany to the US to start the around the world trip. It did have some serious problems and it didn't actually make it to the US until much, much later in the summer. Here's a picture of it. They all had numbers and the, uh, we'll look at the Graf Zeppelin in particular, but LZ was the first two digits for, for any of the airships that were built. The, uh, the LZ-127 was built in Germany. It was really the first commercial passenger flight service named after Ferdinand from Zeppelin, the pioneer in, in airships. Graf, I didn't know this, that it refers to count, which was Ferdinand's status in nobility. No, I don't know what LZ stands for. Luftschiff Zeppelin. That makes a lot of sense, Luftschiff Zeppelin. Okay, 590 total flights from 1928 to 37. For the last five years, it was mainly passenger and mail service between Germany and Brazil. Over a thousand million miles flown. It only carried 24 passengers and a crew of 36. It was, of course, withdrawn from service after the Hindenburg disaster. We know about the Hindenburg, that was LZ-129. And a very fiery crash on May of 1937. Here, the more, more information on the background, the L first one was an LZ-1, built in 1900. Of course, during World War I, the airships bombed London and other strategic targets. LZ-104 was the first intercontinental flight from Bulgaria to Sudan in Africa. Interestingly, as war reparation, the Germans delivered LZ-126 to the U.S. in 1924. The Germans... The U.S. and the Brits were also experimenting with airships, and so you got you got yours. It was commissioned as USS Los Angeles, so it's 650 feet long, 90 feet wide, 104 feet high, with five V12 engines, 400 horsepower each. Wow, a lot of fuel too. Here's a picture of the USS Los Angeles over Manhattan. You can see the little military star down there. Navy Star, uh, all part of the Navy, not the Air Force. It was L1. It was called LZ-126. They switched the lifting gas from hydrogen to helium. For obviously, it's, they knew that it was a lot safer. And U.S. has apparently an incredible resource in in helium, about two hundred thousand miles and over four thousand hours. It was the only airship that the U.S. Had the others, Shenandoah, R30, R30, that's a British number, Akron, Macon, they all came to some other disasters. And here we see this is what they had. I found this fascinating vapor condensers. As they burn fuel, of course, the, the airship get, kept getting lighter and lighter and lighter. So, what would they do? They, they could either vent out hydrogen or helium. Or what they did was they put vapor condensers on the exhaust from the engines to be able to recollect the water vapor, because the gas is mainly water vapor, 
and CO2. So at least they recovered some of the water from the exhaust gases from these engines to help so they wouldn't have to vent too much uh, hydrogen or helium for for to ballast to provide proper ballast. Yeah, the the the, the water the vapor condensers provided ballast. They also did some. They were a part of the terms of the deal. Um, it was that the U.S. would only use it for testing purposes. And one thing they tested was a GE photophone, where they brought the airship over top of Schenectady, New York, where there's GE corporate headquarters, and they still are today. They conducted a radio interview from the Pella on the airship down to uh, an, a radio operator, uh, radio personality on the ground and the transmission was by a beam of light and it's interesting because well alexander graham bell had invented that in 1880 almost 50 years before he had come up with this way i could see why the military would be interested in doing that because there would be no way to intercept this then like you could intercept a radio transmission but it never really worked out. <laughs> but it was an interesting idea, and I like the idea that they tested something very unusual that was already been around for 40 years, but hadn't been commercialized. They also attached uh, gliders and fixed-wing aircraft to the underside of the, uh, the Los Angeles to see if it could be used as a way to, to get these planes up in the air, maybe higher, whatever reasons. Uh, obviously, for the glider, it's just a way of getting it up there. But uh, an interesting bit of testing apparatus, testing, testing philosophy. There are a lot of US airmail covers on eBay just for this LZ-126 airship. Here's the USS Los Angeles, moored to the, uh, the mooring mast on the USS Patoka off Panama. Pretty impressive ship for sure. Yeah. These are the engines, which you see here. You can see three, three of the five engines, one here, one here, one right in the middle, and then there's two more on the opposite side, mirror imaging these two. You can just see a bit of one there, there. Those are the five engines. With fans, they could go either forwards or backwards. And now we're talking about the covers. Uh, that, was, that was the interesting part on, on, on the airships. Um, this is a cover that did go around the world and it was canceled here. And this is where I like a little bit of heart. It says, best I can tell it says, Varick Street Station in New York. And then there's a New York Foreign Double Oval. And of course, the commemorative cancel. There it is. It's the first leg. It was in four legs from Lakers to Friedrichshafen in, in Germany. Now, it had just arrived from Friedrichshafen. So it turned around and went back. Wow. 55 hours. So you can do quickly. That's about 80 miles an hour coming this way or going that way. This was 70 miles an hour average from Tokyo. It's an interesting spelling of Tokyo there with an I instead of a Y. Mm. Got a yep. couple of after five days rest in Friedrichshafen. And then another four or five days, four days rest in, in Tokyo before doing the LA route. And that was only about 50 miles an hour or so. <clears throat> yeah. And then the final was Los Angeles to Lakehurst. And that was fairly low, 60 miles an hour average and about 3,000 miles. So that was the round of four, four segments. Second second cover. We'll talk more about the segments later on. I've got a small some slides at the end of the presentation. Second cover that went around the world here. Well, it was the Atlas Sky Merchant in 1948, where various industries <laughs> uh, used some of the old planes from the war, in particular Atlas. <laughs> Standard Oil, they converted theirs into a mobile product showroom with seats in the front for 17 executives, and in the rear was the display area. They left September, Jersey on January 5th just to go down to Miami. That's really where the trip started, January 13th. 255 hours later, flying time, 50,000 miles, about 100 days later, it arrives in New York again. And the itinerary, what, what part of it was, it was both for marketing, but they also coordinated with the American Airmail Society to have 4,500 souvenir aerograms. 
And as they visited these 20 cities, 29 cities, plus Miami, there's a total of 30 cancels on these souvenir aerograms. The United States Postal Service confiscated the aerograms upon the arrival back in San Francisco because they were carried outside the mails and said, that's, that's not allowed. But including the president of, of the uh, Atlas Sky, um, Atlas Products, he and they, are, they finally have got the post office to release the aerograms. <laughs> they raised money for the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation, which I did a little bit of Googling on that too. It's still in business. It's still collecting money. It's still supporting research into cutting edge cancer uh, research. And they also do have a close affiliation with Broadway in terms of when you buy a nice ticket for a good Broadway production, you automatically make a donation to the Damon Runyon Cancer Research Foundation and you get presumably excellent, excellent seats at the Broadway productions. Here's the cover. They, uh, everything you see in this collection is from my personal collection. Um, and that's in, that's in most all presentations. Um, here there's actually 30 different cancels. It starts in Miami and then goes down to Brazil here. And then over time, this is February 13th, February 15th in Brazil, February uh, 17th, 13th, 15th, 17th in Liberia. So it's gone across the Atlantic. It's now in Africa there on the coast. And then it goes down and all the way around all kinds of other cities, Delhi there, Bombay, Auckland, New Zealand, Wellington, Singapore, Tokyo. They had coordinated through the AMA, the American Air Mail Association, they had coordinated with UPU to get the various member countries to approve and proceed with canceling these 4,500 aerograms. So they already had pre-approval pre from UPU to get this done. But it still meant a lot of work for whoever was in the post office. Here's a close-up of some more of them. Um, you can read most of them. There's Khartoum in Sudan, Karachi in Pakistan, Madras. Here's the actual route. Oh, of course, not January 13th, New York 15, 50,000 miles. They also did for the previous year, April and May of 1947. That's probably just to test it out. These are the kind of products that, that Atlas was offering. Tires, uh, batteries, headlights, air filters, it looks like, spark plugs. So here's the route. We're going to look at the route in a little more detail. Here's the route from, okay, from New York down to Miami and then across to Brazil and then a hop across to, to Monrovia in Liberia, down here, down to South Africa. Presumably this is where they had their, their yeah. customer bases. They've visited their customers. And so you can see here, at least on this map, that traveling across the Atlantic down to South Africa and then back up through here. Then they visit some Arabic companies there, Khartoum in Sudan, Nairobi, Kenya, uh, Bahrain, Cairo. Yeah. There's another Arabic country in here. Then over to Karachi. And what they noticed on this map, this is the sheet, this is this sheet over here. It's the same map. But if you look down here in the bottom corner, they do actually show the uh, this aerogram and the cancels and somebody presenting it to somebody else. So it's a little bit of a graphic on this map about the aerograms. And then from Karachi around here, mainly through a lot of through South, in South Asia, uh, Saigon, and up to Tokyo, back down again, across Darwin, uh, down to Melbourne, and over to New Zealand, and then a couple stops at some of these islands, including Honolulu. And then from there, Honolulu, I didn't show that part of the map, coming back to San Francisco, Chicago, and then New York. So that's the, the actual course. The next cover that went around the world, well, sort of, if you want to call it, um, the RMS Coronia, the cruise ship. It was unique. It took a 90-day annual world cruise, which is about what they do now. It's about 100 days now. Which if you're doing a ground around the world cruise, it's about 100 and 104 days on the big cruise ships now uh, in segments. What's interesting is this particular ship, everything was first class. There's nothing that wasn't first class. There's no second class or steerage or whatever. Everybody was first class. Clara was a woman who lived on the board for 15 years. Here's what it cost. 
we were trying to figure out if that was about 7,000. Could you buy a house in 1955? Maybe a small house. Oh, yeah. Oh, for yeah. Sure, $1,000. So for a, a 90 day excursion, what I don't know is if this was for one or two people. I would, it says basis two. Here's the cover. Now, this has got a wonderful set of Canadian Karsh uh, portrait stamps, um, postmarked February 21st. Now, it wasn't actually, it was postmarked in, in Canada on February 21st, but mailed to South Africa. So sometime thereafter, it would have been received. And oops, I'm getting too fast there. Here's the second one mailed to the same fella, also from Sudbury. And, but it's, and he was, his cab, he was in cabin B108. So that's the mark, the post of manuscript marking there. And he's got an interesting, well, obviously philatelic. Somebody put complete sets of these stamps on cover to get the right postage and, and sent them. He probably had, well, maybe he was a collector and, and he had somebody else mail these at appropriate times beforehand to the various offices. That's where you would do, if you needed to get mail delivered to you, you would tell your person that to, to send the, here's the address and here's about when I'm gonna be there, make certain that the letter gets to me. And here's another wonderful set of prime ministers. And here's some more uh, wilding portraits with um, Smith, all addressed to Smith. So this is India on February 21st. And here he's down in the Philippines on March 18th. Here he is in Okinawa on March 25th. At least we don't know when he got there, but it was sometime after March 25th. So it was postmarked in Sudbury. And here, so I guess, in, yes, obviously, if, if he brought them back to Canada, then they traveled around the world part of the time on the ship and part of the time in air. The interesting, the story behind this is more about what the, the, uh, the radio operator, Ken Mudridge, he has, there were three radio operators on the ship and they each had two four hour shifts, one from midnight and one until 4 a.m. And then he also did the noon to 4 p.m. shift. But on this midnight to 4 a.m. shift, he had his job was to transcribe up the four hours of news reports in Morse code so that they could print out this daily Ocean Times newspaper that was delivered to all passengers. If you've been on a cruise ship, yeah, we always get the some kind of a newspaper, although in more recent times it's been electronic. But yes, they still do this kind of stuff. And uh, But that's an awful lot of Morse code to transcribe. His job in the afternoon, though, was different. From the noon to 4 p.m. shift, he would arrange ship-to-shore phone calls for passengers. And he had to contact the appropriate phone office by Morse code, give them the ship's latitude and longitude, and then that what technician would rotate their directional beam antennas toward the ship. They try different frequencies to get a clear signal, and sometimes it took two or three hours, two two hours for a three minute call. All part of the radio operator's daily life on the Coronia. <laughs> that ship, though, when it reached its end of the life in a control sinking. They scavenged what they could, scrapped what they could get, and then they sunk it off of Guam. Now, number four, the icebreaker Eastwind, which is part of the US Coast Guard, built in 44 to patrol Greenland. It was actually quite, it did some important work on, on Greenland in terms of uh, how some transferring the 200 Marines who captured the, the last German base uh, on Greenland. It was the first icebreaker to go around the world. <laughs> but they went started in the north, went in Boston through the Panama Canal oh, down wow. to New Zealand. So they did oh. go. They mm -hmm. went top to bottom too. Um, over to McMurdo Sound. That was the main reason, just to deliver supplies to the the station at McMurdo Sound in Antarctica. Then they came mm -hmm. through the Indian Ocean, back through the Suez Canal, and back to Boston. Six months what it took. Oh, here's a picture of them down. Penguins are wondering what's going on here when they see this uh, ship. Recover canceled in May of, I didn't even check the date on that, presumably 61. And of course, the Challenger, of course, it, 
Its first flight was in April 4th of 83. I didn't realize how quickly these turned these things around. It left in April, it came back, back in June again, came back, back in August 30th. So this is the, uh, the third flight, August 30th of 83. Total of 10 flights. And we all know about the unfortunate tragedy when it took off in 86. This is the cover from the August flight. August 30th, about 90 minutes per orbit, 98 orbits around the Earth. So I guess this cover traveled 4, 4 million kilometers. So personal trips. In the work I was doing, I had to go around the world quite frequently, mainly 2004, 2005. I did it eight around the world trips and I carried covers. I first canceled them in Canada. And then as I went along, I applied the appropriate international rate postage for each of the countries I visited. And some I mailed home from the last country I visited and the rest I carried them home. And here's one of them. It starts off in Canada with the year of the rooster stamp for international postage. Then over to China, Singapore for these two stamps, Australia, Germany, Spain, and then with Spain, I mailed it and sent it home. And that's it there. But I tried to reconstruct the dates. There must have been some mis mix up in the dates here. I do have all the boarding passes in a separate folder. And this date over here just doesn't quite seem right. These are some dates aren't quite right. I, this was the order for sure. I had to ask the lady in China to marry me, but that's another story. Um, it's commemorative covers. Now, these are actually covers that didn't travel around the world, but they're commemorating some event that involved the circumnavigation of the moon of the Earth. In this case, it's uh, Sir Francis Chichester who did it in a sailboat. Yeah, that particular sailboat was an America's Cup challenger at one point. Oh, okay. And the Brightling Orbiter 3 balloon, they did a uh, it was the first non-stop circumnavigation in a balloon. Now, Brightling Orbiter 1 and Brightling Orbiter 2 both didn't make it, but Orbiter 3 did. That Brightling is the Swiss watch people. Here's a picture of it. This is an interesting one because there's covers available, but this is the ghost, the global horizontal sounding technique. It's a weather monitoring platform, and they produce these covers from going around the world flight number 60 or 80 or something. And uh, on the balloon called the John F. Kennedy, 1957. And here's one from the 50th anniversary of and remember the Graf Zeppelin in 79, a U.S. issue with stamps featuring Orville and Wilbur Wright. Here's one from an around the world cruise. A Swedish cover starting in Gutenberg, special cancellation of Sweden. Commercial airlines, of course, they've all done their own. Now, these ones probably went around the world, carried on the various planes. Um, JAL for the first one here. Qantas also did their own around the world flight in 58. SAS, the Thai airline in 81. And Concord did their Tour du Monde in 1987. Now, I don't know if that was the sufficient postage or whether that this was a envelope philatelique, voyage à bord, meaning it was carried. Okay, so this is one that did go around the world on the Concorde. And I think that's concluded.